Um, I just wanted to start with a kind of point of why study past disasters, um, especially I get this a lot um, with uh, my main focus being on the UK. Um, when I presented in the US and places like that, kind of the general thought is that we don't really have any extreme weather um, in the UK, but uh, my answer to that is it's usually all relative. Um, beyond their ability to help us prepare for future events, um, what can looking at past weather events and floods show us um, about the past? So in introducing this topic, I always uh, like to use a quote from this great book um, by the American disaster historian Jacob Reams. Um, and the book is a study of working class communities and their response to two disasters in the progressive era in North America. That's the Salem fire of 1914 and the Halifax explosion of 1917. Um, and no need to scribble any of these down. Um, I've, I've added a bibliog bibliography at the end and I think my slides are gonna be shared. So if anyone is interested in following up any of the uh, books or things I reference, they'll, they'll be provided at the end. Now in the introduction to this book, Dis Disaster Citizenship, Jacob Ream says, people rarely record borrowing a cup of sugar from a neighbor, but when those same neighbors rescue each other after a disaster, people take notice and record the event. Disasters thus produce unusual records that document where people turned in times of trouble or crisis. Unions, churches and mutual aid societies were not designed for disaster relief, but how they behaved in disasters shows us something about how they functioned. And this is something I'm very interested in that as well as providing a snapshot of that specific, specific um, disaster or specific moment, uh, they really also show us some things that are often hard for historians to get at about how communities operated, about how social contracts and trust and support networks operated. The kind of things that are often hard to see in normal documentary evidence from a period. So one of my central interests of, in my research is who gets remembered. And, and why they might get remembered and trying to think about how we can better understand this. Now, some events pass into the national cultural memory uh, quite quickly, while others seemingly just as horrific at the time they occurred, quickly fade away as time passes. Now, I'm sure if I was to ask everyone on this call this evening to name one past disaster in the UK or one past extreme weather event, uh, we'd get a, a mixed uh, response, perhaps the most famous or infamous in, in recent decades is the Great Storm of 1987, which ripped across the southern half of England in October of that year. Now, while this storm caused 13 deaths and was an extremely expensive event, part of the reason it's passed into popular cultural memory is the now infamous uh, forecast by Michael Fish, which I'm sure many of you will be aware of in which he kind of, kind of glibly remarked about a caller who was worried about a hurricane. Um, now this, this forecast has kind of gone down in folklore. It's um, been commemorated in the Olympic opening ceremony in 2012. Um, now, so this may be part of the reason this storm is remembered, you know, this, this kind of cock up by fish. There's partly an element that the storm hit a very densely populated area in the south of the country. There's also a kind of recency effect the fact that it happened within living memory helps it to still be remembered. Another event I just wanted to bring up uh, in this opening part is to, uh, again, probably less remembered by younger generations, but one that will be remembered by older generations who are alive in the period, but also forever remembered by the community it afflicted. And that's the Aberfan disaster in 1966. And the physical scars and the mental scars left by this disaster mean that this will probably never be forget, forgotten by the small village it affected. For those who don't know, the Aberfan disaster was uh, happened when a poorly maintained colliery spoil tip collapsed, engulfing part of the village of Aberfan in Wales, killing 116 children and 28 adults as it hit Pankglass Junior School and other buildings on that side of the village. This is remembered for several reasons, partly because of the horrific number of children killed, but also because this is what uh, disaster scholars refer to as a clear technological disaster. That is, the cause of the event was purely human mismanagement of the landscape. Now, I thought before I go into my main 
case study, I'd just quickly mention one other last example. And that's to highlight that while the recency of events really does affect how they're commemorated in society. Some past extreme weather events from a much longer period are also still recorded and remembered uh, widely. And the example I wanted to give here is um, the storm of 1703. And this has really been memorialized um, by Daniel Defoe in his account, The Storm. Now this is an interesting case because um, Defoe got uh, saw accounts from 60 different people who'd been afflicted by the storm. And, and as such, the account is very vivid in its portrayal of the storm. And the book is often called one of the first pieces of modern journalism uh, because of the approach of getting first-hand witness accounts. Okay, so that kind of gives the overview of where my research is situated. And then I thought for this talk this evening, I'd focus in on one extreme weather event, perhaps the one I've done the most research on, um, and talk a little bit about how we might perceive this from different perspectives and how different historical records might affect the kind of account we would get of these kind of events. So the flood I'd like to speak about tonight is the North Sea flood of 1953. Um, some of you may be familiar with this event, others might not be. Um, just to give you a little account of, of, of what happened, the East Coast storm surge uh, of the January 31st, 1953. It was the worst naturally triggered disaster in 20th century Britain. In the UK alone, it accounted for 440 deaths, over 160,000 acres of flooded land, 1,200 breaches of sea defences, damage to 24,000 properties, and the evacuation of over 32,000 citizens. The true death toll is possibly larger, as it's unclear whether official figures also included um, several fishing vessels that were sunk by the storm. The storm's first casualties came with the sinking of the passenger ferry MV Princess Victoria, as it passed from Stranra in Scotland to Larn in Northern Ireland at about 2 p.m. on the 31st of January, and this resulted in 133 deaths. The storm surge hit the shore at Spurnhead, Yorkshire, just to the north of the map there that you can see, about 4 p.m. before progressing southwards along the east coast of England, causing a further 307 deaths. Now in that image there, um, I'm not sure how clearly you can all see that on your screens, um, there's some yellow, it, the black shows where the flooding occurred, but there's some yellow boxes which highlight that most of the deaths, over 70%, actually occurred in just five main clusters. Um, and going from the north to the south there, that first cluster is at Mablethorpe and Sutton-on-Sea, where 16 people died. Hunt-Stanton and Snetisham, where 65 people died. Felixstowe and Harwich, where over 40 died. Jaywick, where 37 died. And Canvey Island, where 58 died. And now this picture here is um, an aerial photograph of Canvey Island uh, the day after the flooding. And as you can see, the distinction between the river channel either side of the island is pretty much completely gone. Now, despite the significant lag time between the first landfall at Spurnhead in Yorkshire and communities like Canvey Island in Essex further down the coast, who were not inundated until 10 past one in the morning, no direct public warnings were issued and each community had to deal with the deadly deluge independently. Late on the 31st, the Met Office had issued a warning to the Thames River Board under a new surge warning system established after floods in 1928, which was passed on to the BBC via the police. So anyone who was still awake and listening to the radio at midnight was unassumingly advised of an exceptionally high tide in the River Thames and Medway the following morning. The spring tide, in fact, combined with the extreme anti-cyclone weather front and produced tides two metres above forecasts and waves of up to 4.9 metres. The Netherlands were also devastatingly hit by the same weather system, and in the Netherlands about 1,800 people died. Much of this coastline had neglected sea defences due to a lack of investment during the war, and many of the worst affected communities were housed in temporary prefabricated or bungalow accommodation. The event highlighted huge inadequacies in both physical sea defences, but also in central government disaster policy. Despite the response to the flooding being predominantly led by the community, and the fact that by the time the central government became involved, most of the search and rescue effort had already been completed. 
little blame was assigned either to individuals or the agencies involved. The post-war setting of the event and the relative infancy of the mass media mean that the flood has been almost forgotten in the public memory of UK 20th century history. In stark contrast, in the Netherlands, the flood event triggered a major dike improvement scheme, expanded land reclamation efforts, and the events of late January and early February 1953 remain well known and central to the national identity of the Netherlands. Now, my initial interest in the 1953 floods was from the point of view of the lack of coordinated national response. Why was the response to the flooding predominantly community led? Why didn't different districts warn each other as the flood passed down the coast? And why didn't the central government get involved until Monday morning when the flood had struck on Saturday night? So to tonight, rather than just giving you a polished account of what happened during and after these floods, I thought I would highlight how the different historical records available on these floods can narrate differently the story of this disaster. So to start, let's zoom out to perhaps the most impersonal lens, the lens which is often used by those interested in past extreme weather events for climate modeling and similar purposes. The scientific picture. So scientific expertise and research on weather, hydrography and flooding had grown greatly in the first half of the 20th century. And as such, the flood was extremely well mapped and studied. It produced a huge amount of data that kept tidal experts and hydrographical researchers busy for years afterwards. How would a meteorologist describe the event? The event, well, perhaps something like this. The flood of the night of the 31st of January to 1st of February 1953, which predominantly affected the eastern counties of Lincolnshire, Norfolk, Suffolk, Essex and Kent, was caused by a combination of two meteorologically distinct events. The first of these was a depression and subsequent anticyclone wind system that developed in the Atlantic, traveled around the north of Scotland, and then intensified as it was funneled south along the east coast of the UK. The detailed synoptic charts of the event provided show that it was the worst northerly gale on record in the British Isles. The depression combined with a spring tide along the east coastline, the height of which, height of which many harbors and the Met Office had underpredicted. In South End, the observed tide was ultimately 2.4 metres higher than it had been forecast. Due to the shallow nature of the North Sea, the localised decrease in atmospheric pressure from the cyclone and the high tide combined, the level of the North Sea rose by 2 metres south of the Humber, with waves reaching over 4.9 metres. So that's a kind of dry account that you might have received from a meteorologist in the period. Um, on the slide here, we can see one of the charts that was produced in one of the first papers that looked at what happened that evening. And so this just shows the uh, mean sea levels and the disturbances from mean sea level in the different uh, points on the east coast. And then on the right of the slide here, we have a picture of a Kelvin tidal predictor. Now, this is an instrument that had been used from about around the mid 1920s to try and predict the height of tides. Um, this one was at the Liverpool Tidal Institute, which is today known as the National Oceanogra Oceanography Centre, which is now part of the University of Liverpool. So, so far, so one dimensional and dry. So what do the floods look like if we turn to the national records? What do the national newspapers and the records at the National Archives show us about the flooding? As highlighted in the opening outline of the floods, while central government was very slow to respond, once journalists began to reach the region and share images from the floods and run huge spreads in the national dailies, the enormity of the floods quickly became apparent. So here on the slide, we have a double page spread from the Daily Mirror, which was on the 2nd of February, the Monday. Um, and also we have a journalist photograph of volunteers trying to repair a breach of the bank uh, on the Great Ouse in Norfolk. Um, this was then trying to repair it before the next high tide came and further inundated the region. So while for local communities, the aftermath was about survival and grieving, for most Brits in other regions, the aftermath focused on fundraising and quite quickly turned to looking at government failures. The government's lack of preparedness, the rundown state of the flood defences and the ineffectiveness of Westminster structures in predicting and responding to a storm of this scale all became central points of discussion. Now, given this focus, for me as a historian of science and environmental historian, 
initially interested in how the flood changed policy and future preparedness, the National Archives then hold a great wealth of information. From the records at the National Archives, we can look at meteorological reports and aspects of the flood in the Air Ministry records. We can see in depth the damage and restoration reports and documents as created by each of the individual regional river boards under the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry and Fisheries. We could also see the Treasury reports on the financial assistance given to companies and individuals. Now, the short overview of the files on the financial assistance is that regional infrastructure like docks and railways got direct support from the Ministry of Transport. Companies crucial to post-war reconstruction got some government support. Some limited individuals, mainly landowners, got some compensation. But most small businesses and families were left to struggle with insurance companies if they had insurance or for the majority, they just had to rely on charity. And that was mainly through the Lord Mayor's Fund that was set up in the aftermath. Now, also in the records of the National Archive, we can see the extensive records and proceedings of the inevitable inquiry into the causes of the East Coast flood disaster, which was led by John Anderson, the first Viscount Waverley, um, him of air raid shelter fame. And his interim report in 1953 and his final report in 1954 led to many major changes in flood prediction and disaster response coordination. However, in all of this documentation, even in the evidence that the Waverley Committee heard, the local and the personal are almost completely absent. We get a wonderful sense of the scale of the problems and devastation caused by events, particularly through a series of aerial photographs taken by the Ministry of Dis Defence shortly after the floods. But the individual communities and families destroyed by the flood appear largely as statistics. And while the urgency of many of the problems can be felt in the tone of civil servants' writings, the events as catalogued by these extensive records seem very procedural and lacking in humanity. So following my initial work on the floods and how they acted as a catalyst for national policy in the development of better prediction and warning systems, I became increasingly interested in learning more about how the communities afflicted responded and survived the trauma. Now, if you search North Sea flood, um, and limit it to 1953 to 55 on the National Archives Discovery Catalogue. In addition to the 18 folders held at the National Archives, you'll also see that there are about 15 held by regional archives and county record offices. Now these records give a much richer flavour of how the 1953 floods afflicted and completely changed local towns and communities. So in my own research, I, can be, I became very interested in the town of Kings Lynn, the local church. So I'm not sure how clearly you can see them again on the slide, depending on your screen. But these flood markers, interestingly, um, which are in the entranceway of the church, show the high watermark for 1953 below the high watermark for the much less deadly and much less famous 1978 floods. And this interested me because the kind of national picture is that 1953 was the worst natural disaster to hit the UK in the 20th century. But it showed in this one locality right on the coast there, um, actually in 1978, the water had got higher, but less people had died. So just a little bit about the flood in Kings Lynn. The storm surge reached its maximum in Kings Lynn at 720. Its height at the town's harbour was calculated as somewhere between 2.5 and 2.7 metres above sea level. Approximately one fifth of the town was inundated. And around 1,800 homes were evacuated. Water as deep as 5.8 metres was recorded in properties close to the main waterways. And despite the widespread inundation, casualties were relatively low, with only 15 deaths being recorded in the town. Although the flooding did occur after dark, the fact that not many people had yet gone to bed prevented a lot of uh, lives from being lost in the town. And this was a pardon that was not afforded many communities further along the coast like Canby Island. Now in the county record office, you can see these beautiful large maps made by uh, local water board engineers that show the extent of the flooding. 
um, on this little section here, which is uh, of the main waterway. This is the River Ouse as it comes into Kings Lynn. And this is one of the keys here, the South Key. But I just wanted to zoom in just so you can sort of see there, these measurements are in feet. Um, so this is letting you know in, in these immediate buildings that are colored in red is where the flooding occurred. Um, and in, in these immediate buildings, they were receiving somewhere around one story and above flooding level. Um, and as many of you will know, some of the poorest housing in some of these towns, uh, the poorest of the poor were living in basements. And so if the flooding was going above one story height, many of those communities, not so much in Kingsland, but in some of the other towns further along the coast, didn't stand much chance when there was no advanced warning. Now, in addition to the marker stone that first triggered my interest in the town of Kings Lynn, um, as I looked through local records, I increasingly became interested in the actual, the role the church has played in the aftermath in Kings Lynn. Because as, as the flood crippled communication lines across the East Coast, along the East Coast of Britain, um, each community had to rely on its own networks. Local police, town councils and volunteers were central to immediate efforts to save lives, feed and shelter those who'd spent the night exposed to the storm and ultimately to collect and deal with the dead. Despite the relatively low number of casualties in Kingsland itself, the town is the administrative centre for a larger number of scattered rural communities in the region. So along the 15 mile coast stretch from Kingsland Lynn to Hunt Stanton alone, there were a further 65 deaths and the town became a hub for the regional emergency response. The churches that hadn't been flooded, so the, the central church there was flooded, but the, let me just go back one. So the churches that weren't flooded, this is St. Margaret's where the, the flood marker is, um, but also Saints was flooded as well in Union Chapel, but there was a few churches higher up around in, the, in off this map um, that weren't flooded. They became the de facto emergency centres. They offered shelter, warmth and food to those who'd lost their homes. Um, St. Margaret's in central Kings Lynn was still under two feet of water. It was the Union Chapel in South Lynn. This is just actually on the edge of this map that became the main principal haven of refuge. Now, local churches were central to the collection and distribution of immediate aid and provisions, distributing food, clothes and other sundries. Now, exploring in detail the response of regional community organisations such as the churches in Kings Lynn helps us build a more detailed understanding of how the response to the floods was delivered and understood by those involved. Now, whilst the national media and government in 1953 focused on the exceptional nature of the floods and the resilient wartime spirit with which communities responded, the narrative that emerges at the community level in Kings Lynn, at least, is one still centred on resilience but it's also characteristic, characterized by continuity and a normalization of flooding in the town. Take, for example, the congregation of All Saints Church in Kings Lynn, 24 of whom turned up for the service on the Sunday morning immediately after the overnight flooding. This is despite the church already being flooded to a depth of seven inches when the congregation had left Saturday Evensong. The rector's home was also under three feet of water but nevertheless, he celebrated the Holy Eucharist at 11 a.m. and then led efforts and the with the congregation to clean up the church after that so that it could be ready for the first funerals on Wednesday, the 4th of February. Now, these events highlight the central role the church played in Kings Lynn, both as part of the everyday routine and rhythm of the community, but also is an extra importance in times of disruption and dislocation. Through this one simple anecdote, we see that the church is embedded and valued place within the community, a characteristic heralded in disaster studies as strongly influencing community resilience was so important for this town. Alongside accounts of other non-governmental organisations such as the Red Cross, the two local newspapers in Kingsley covered in detail the multiple roles the local churches were playing and acted as a kind of notice board to help people uh, repatriate with family, to know where they could go for food and those kind of things. Um, however, surprisingly, the church records themselves make very little reference to the floods. Where they do mention events of uh, January and early February 53, the severity and exceptional human toll is noted but across all of the meetings, minutes, logbooks, it's given at most a paragraph of discussion. 
And this is despite the fact that the committee for Stepney Baptist Church, which met only three days after the floods, calmly noted in their meeting minutes that the minister and church secretary left after tea because of another flood warning for the area. The two main Baptist churches, Union Chapel and Stepney, did produce a joint memorandum commemorating the floods. Yet rather than circulating this amongst their congregations, they decided that the report should simply be placed in the minute book of both churches to act as a permanent memorial of the catastrophe. These somewhat humble and understated gestures, gestures hint at the normalcy of flooding and the threat from the sea in the longer history of the town and these congregations. The sea and its dangers were never far away from life in the region, and as, a, and as community figureheads, local rectors were only too familiar with the risks posed to their coastal congregations, many of whom made their livelihoods from the sea. In the weeks that followed the floods, the churches, along with other local volunteers and non-governmental agencies, such as the Scouts and St. John Ambulances, continued to play a central role in the relief efforts. All of the main congregations established their own disaster relief funds for those within their catchment and their denomination. The church leadership promoted the plight of those in the region through national and international forums, including the Anglican National Church Assembly held in, New York, in London. In addition to their involvement with physical relief efforts, the church has also played an important and cathartic social role in helping the communities to deal with the emotional and psychological trauma of the disaster. Now, recent sociological and psychological studies of disaster have shown that such support is integral to a community's social resilience and recovery after an event like the 1953 flood. So now in an effort to try and truly illuminate events of the flood, I'd like to turn to personal experiences. In the immediate aftermath, while there were expressions of grief and also anger, the lack of support and help most of those examples were quite limited and tempered. The overwhelming dominant theme of personal accounts in newspapers and recorded in newsreel from the period focused on the stoic character of survivors. Accounts from the whole area reported stories of great personal sacrifice and heroism in the face of adversity, such as the US Air Force servicemen who based at Scunthorpe were some of the first to respond to the disaster, including um, Corporal Leeming, who became the first non British recipient of the George Medal after, despite being a non-swimmer, saved 27 people in the area in a rubber raft that one newspaper proudly described that he self-inflated. Framed within very much a wartime blitz spirit narrative, and that's quite well typified by this short Pathé newsreel video about Canvey Island. Now I thought I'd just show this clip. Sometimes Zoom isn't the best for showing video clips. Hopefully the sound works fine and, and you can get the feel of this. Um, but if not, we'll come back to it and I can explain what happens. Let's give it a whirl. Seaside resorts devastated in the Great Flood disaster. Today, her golden beaches are thronged with holidaymakers, drawn by the warm welcome of the proud people whose home this is. Only a few months ago, it seemed impossible that Canvey could ever recover. The sea walls had been breached and the water had gushed in to destroy homes and families. A courageous people, these, unafraid of the heavy task of... Okay, um, hopefully you got most of the sound on that. And if you didn't, the general picture was that just the summer after the floods, this was a promotional video saying Canvey Island's open for business. Um, it showed the community had rebuilt and, re and was ready for the tourists to come for the summer season. Um, but these accounts, they fail to truly grasp the immediate, but also the long-term psychological damage wrought on many families and village communities uh, after this event. Through later reflective accounts, more candid oral histories and stories, we can start to understand the real personal cost of the floods. Now, some of the most vivid accounts are included in commemorative literature that was produced by journalists and publishers in the following years. Now, this account was produced by a, a, local, uh, a local book 25 years after 
the, the floods. Uh, and this one always stands out for me as kind of getting more to the personal traumas of the flood. And this is from a 1978 local history. Many East Anglian families, and not only those who lost loved ones, are still psychologically marred by the disaster. For some, there are occasional physical reminders, as on one Norfolk farm where the plough still, nearly 25 years later, occasionally turns up pots of ink, bottles, combs, and other items from the sea. A continuing souvenir for thousands of homeowners in the coastal towns and villages is the difficulty of decorating walls, which were saturated with seawater and will, according to expert advice, never again take and hold paint or paper satisfactorily. Now, I think that quote kind of encapsulates a little bit of, of some of the poverty in some of the, the region as well, that people had to patch up their houses as best they could if they didn't have insurance. Some of the most moving accounts about the 1953 flood come from a 2002 BBC documentary on the catastrophe. Unfortunately, it's not available online at the moment, but I, one uh, account in this, um, two of the surviving members of the Mansa family who lost three siblings that fateful night, they break down on camera as they state that they've lived their lives without closure because their parents never spoke of events. And they didn't even know where their siblings were buried until 50 years after the flood. So it wasn't until filming uh, this sequence for the BBC documentary that they finally discovered where their siblings were buried because their parents had never spoken about what happened. The fact that so many survivors from the 53 floods never spoke about events until years later, and when they did broke down at the first time they'd ut uttered a lost sibling's name is utterly heartbreaking. And although the lack of psychological support offered to communities was typical of the time, the limited focus on this aspect by academics and experts has somewhat masked the real legacy the flood left in these communities. In many communities that suffered large death tolls in the flood of 1953, such as the five clusters I showed on the opening map, it's possible that what we might today call corrosive community symptoms arose. That symptoms that kind of go beyond the individual psychological problems to actual whole communities having shared uh, issues with PTSD and other similar effects. Um, so while oral histories captured immediately after the floods are quite limited, um, there are a few resources that are out there. There's uh, luckily a lot of community groups who've done more now to capture some of these stories. Um, one of the best is um, the Canby Island uh, website has collected a lot of memories for people who survived the floods in Canby Island. And I'll provide all the links at the end. But now we've kind of got to the personal. I just wanted to finish um, by a couple of resources that may interest you further. Um, the best way for me, actually, once I sort of wanted to learn more about this, was actually to go to this coast and have a bit of a pilgrimage. So, um, sorry, I've gone too far there. For the 60th anniversary, uh, um, I, I took a trip down the exist along the coast. And again, I'll provide the link at the end, um, but that's on you. YouTube, if people are interested in learning a little bit more about it, is a database called the Tempest Database. And if you're interested in learning more about um, past weather events in your area, this is a database where historians have compiled uh, diaries, public records, all kinds of accounts from the last five hundred years plus in the UK, um, sort of these historical accounts, and some of them are fascinating. They have, you know, farmers' accounts of drought from the 1600 and things like that in them. Um, so I guess thank you. Uh, and I hope in this short overview of the floods of 1953, I've shown how using a range of different historical records, uh, historians can get a more in-depth picture of extreme weather events. And also I hope I've demonstrated how such a fleeting but often devastating disaster provides us with a unique snapshot to understand uh, our society and our communities and how they pull together in times of adversity. Um, this image on this final slide here is another project I did after some of this research where I was working and looking at um, past snow and extreme winter weather in Cumbria in the Lake District. Um, and as part of collecting oral histories in the area, um, I got a load of records of old photographs from the area and uh, geolocated them to where they are today and made these images that kind of mix the, the old historic records uh, with the, the modern site today. And then these formed part of the kind of oral histories and uh, an exhibition we did in the Lake District. Um, but yeah, 
uh, thank you for listening and um, I'd be happy to discuss any questions or interesting things that come up um, uh, now. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alex. That's absolutely, absolutely fascinating. If people have got uh, questions they'd like to ask, can you use the chat symbol that's at the bottom of the screen in the middle and just type, type your questions in and then we can sort them out with Alex. But whilst you're doing that, Alex, interesting about the official report from about the, uh, the flooding. I sort of get a sense when you compare, say, that with, for example, the current Grenfell um, inquiry, that in those days it was very much a top-down approach, whereas today with Grenfell it's from the bottom up, sh shall we say. Is, is that a fair assessment? Yes, I think so. I think that the, the, I kind of got interested a little bit in that because it wasn't necessarily a given that an event like this would get an inquiry in that period. You know, today, almost any event that, that has, you know, loss of civilian life w will have some kind of inquiry attached beyond the, you know, the standard coroner's kind of uh, re reports and, and, and investigations. Um, but it wasn't really always a given. The scale of the Waverley Committee w was much bigger than others of the period, but that largely reflected the kind of outpouring of grief about the number of deaths. Um, yeah, it wasn't really a given. There was there was um, floods in 1928 that had triggered a similar inquiry, but that was largely because they almost flooded the Houses of Parliament. Um, and uh, central governments are always quicker to respond if, it, if the water is literally at their doorstep. Um, uh, the, I mean, the, the saddest thing about the Waverley Committee is their recommendations were quite far reaching, but they weren't implemented in any in any kind of meaningful way. I think, you know, if we... If I said how the Netherlands kind of took this this event, it killed a lot more people in the Netherlands. Yeah. But they took this event very, you know, it, it, right to the core of their national psyche. They rebuilt their flood defences to a one in mm. one thousand year level. Mm. Britain rebuilt theirs to a one in two hundred year level. Right. So just the kind of scale of response that came. I mean, obviously, the Netherlands is at huge threat from floods so it's a yeah. you know huge amount of reclaimed land so they they understood what this meant for their future but you know now we're kind of um 60 plus years past the floods um they're still living under the benefits of that kind of investment after the floods whereas we're now kind of having to piecemeal fix certain parts of the defenses again yeah okay we haven't haven't got any questions popped up in the chat well certainly not at my end. No. The, the website about extreme weather events, that's absolutely fascinating. It sounds like a really rich resource. Yeah, so I've just gone on to the, because I'm still sharing there, that this is the last slide and it's got, I've put some online resources. Yes. Um, if people are interested, there's a yeah. YouTube video, there's the database, yeah. um, there's a couple of, and, and there's a link here to more, um, more newsreel footage from the period which is something i always love wasting a few hours on um and you can see the kind of different takes from the newsreel footage yeah. um especially there's a couple of videos on there that were sold internationally so they have a slightly different perspective yeah. and then th this here is the kind of more the more thorough bibliography of the, th the resources i drew upon there yeah um the, the, the database was was done by a team, um, well, uh, across several universities. Liv University of Liverpool is who hosts it, mm -hmm. um, Tempest. And yeah, it's a, it's a great resource for anyone who's interested in this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, even if you're kind of more usually, say, interested in local history, um, because it, there are the accounts of these extreme events, they give you a very different view sometimes on on that one specific location mm -hmm. so and there's really unexpected things in there there's um accounts of tornadoes um you know that we don't think of as something that occur in the uk yeah. but occasionally do occur yeah. um yeah. you know there's and and the team did a real good job with that of especially the further you go back in time trying to interpret what a local farmer meant when he used a certain word so that you're not totally interpreting it wrong because it doesn't just, you know, it doesn't just rely on um, actual thermometer and meteorological records. It relies a lot on sort of descriptive accounts. Yeah. We have a question popped up from Simon. 
um, relating it to the Harrow rail accident in October 52. And well, that's a similar kind of response. Yes, um, so they, um, there's a kind of sequence of, of catastrophes and disasters in this period um, that kind of all coalesce to kind of influence policy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's several rail events. There's um, the Lynmouth flooding in 1952, um, which obviously, unfortunately, hasn't been an isolated event for, for the, the, that town and other towns in that area, um, which was a flash flood event. Um, and there's also the Great Smog as well in London. Um, so there's kind of a coalescence of these kind of with with a fairly, you know, and part of why I got interested in is, is this kind of idea that I think for, for people who were alive in the period, they're still very well remembered, these floods. But I think for a younger generation, they're kind of not part of that kind of national sort of memory. Um, but so other parts are, so the smogs are kind of more remembered. Um, part of this seems to be just at the kind of media level that the early 50s, a lot of the national media was a kind of um, optimistic time, you know, it was the coronation, they had um, sort of the successes of climbing Everest and things like this. Oh. Uh, and it kind of didn't fit some of the wider, especially for the, the national press, it didn't necessarily to dwell on some of these things. They were kind of dealt with and left with quite quickly. Yeah, yes. Chris is asking about the Thames Barrier. Was that as, as a result of this flooding or did that come later? Um, the, the Thames Barrier is a good example of that, how long it takes sometimes to get from kind of scientific or technical expertise and engineering through to sort of delivering politically. Um, it had first been discussed unsurprisingly after those floods in 1928 when uh, when Parliament kind of started to worry that, wait a minute, mm. we could be flooded and well, central London could be flooded. Um, but then it had fallen down the wayside and yeah, 53 really pushed it back up the agenda again. And obviously in the interim period and um, the technology and the engineering know-how had grown a lot. Um, but then again, despite it being a recommendation of investigation from the committee, um, it wasn't until I think 1960 that um, Herman Bondi was, was given a, a, a remit to investigate this more seriously and headed up another committee. And then it wasn't until the 70s that, that it really started in earnest. Um, so it's a kind of really protracted kind of process. Partly some of the delays are, were in engineering expertise. Um, but it, again, if you kind of look at the scale of investment in the Netherlands um, and other countries that sort of have a similar kind of uh, lowland sort of setting, there were technologies out there that could have been used, but they, what ultimately emerged was a bit more advanced than the kind of initial discussions. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, well, I think I've, we haven't got any more questions. So, Alex, a uh, very big thank you. That was extremely interesting. And given that this is the first in our theme of talks around weather and the environment as recorded in the archives, that, that's been a very interesting and a very mm. useful start. So a very big thank you to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, we've just got some details of the next uh, talk that's coming up on the 6th of April. Maggie's going to hit the button for us. There we are. Um, our president, Dr. Helen Fry, will be talking about her latest book on MI9. There are, there are details on, on the website, so please book. In fact, booking has already been quite brisk. We're up to about 26 to 30 members already have signed up. So we look forward to seeing you um, on, the, on the 6th of April. So thank you everybody for your time this evening. And I suppose I should end on usual advice. Stay safe and well, but also keep calm and carry on. Thank you very much and good night to you. <laughs>